All righty. Um, Marguerite, can you just go ahead and monitor the waiting room um, in case anybody else joins? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Julia Masters. You've probably seen some emails from me. Um, I'm the program manager for uh, the Microgrids for Community Resilience uh, grant program, which we're so excited um, to have recently launched our planning grant portion of. Um, and we're really excited to bring you all some um, insights into both the program and some free technical assistance that we have through um, some folks that uh, are contracted with um, an arm of DOE. So I will go ahead and get started. Um, I believe everyone can see my screen. Um, just holler if there are any issues with that. So we will go on to the next one. Um, yeah, if you guys have any um, questions or comments throughout, um, we'll definitely have time for Q&A at the end. So please feel free to put that in the chat. Um, and as you all saw, this, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Colorado Resiliency Office's website. So if um, you need to hop out at any point and then come back in, um, just know that it'll also be recorded. Um, and so we'll move right along. Um, we have a pretty stacked agenda today, which um, I think will serve everyone quite well. Um, we'll have a little bit of an update from me from the uh, Colorado Resiliency Office on the MCR program and the rollout. And then I will turn it over to um, some of our partners, Carlos and Pam, um, who will be talking about this free technical assistance that is um, available for folks. Um, we really want to get all of that information out in front of you all so that you can figure out the best way um, to leverage this opportunity. Um, so we will take up probably the bulk of the time um, to learn about their offerings and the work that they've done thus far. Um, and then we'll kind of close out with some uh, additional opportunities for technical assistance and Q&A. So I wanted to start by framing um, this webinar is part of a, a webinar series that the Colorado Resiliency Office puts on um, called the Climate Webinars. It's a quarterly uh, held series that focuses on different themes throughout um, throughout the year. Um, it's a continuation of a series from 2021. And um, as, as these um, slides indicate, there have been microgrid related um, topics that you can see here, both um, generally on grid resiliency and then specifically on the San Miguel County Clean Energy Projects. Um, so if you're interested in looking back at other examples of how um, you know, we've engaged with microgrids work in the past, um, feel free to check those out. Moving forward, though, these um, webinars will, will be held quarterly and are meant for local governments and partners to be able to understand better solutions and actions um, taken to address climate change. So there will be more opportunities being posted on, um, on our website uh, as we schedule those and just keep an eye out if you are interested in attending. Um, I also wanted to call out uh, DOLA's local funding guide. This is a tool that um, exists on our website. Um, we will absolutely uh, share this link uh, via these slides and uh, as a takeaways doc um, after this call. Um, but this is a really, a really great tool that our team has put together that you can filter by all of these six different categories. Um, and come up with the various funding opportunities, both state and federal, that are available for folks. So just another great way if you're trying to kind of wrap your head around the variety of um, funding opportunities that are being thrown at us all the time, this is a good place to start that journey. Um, now, just to kind of orient us towards the topic that we are all here to discuss, microgrids. Um, as you can see on the screen, um, this is a really, I think, handy dandy um, visual to show kind of the variety of different technologies that can be engaged within and around a microgrid. And um, our partners, Carlos and Pam, will be talking a little bit more in depth about various technologies. But um, I want to just, you know, highlight this definition that DOE puts out, um, a group of interconnected loads and distributed energy resources within clearly identified electrical boundaries boundaries that acts as a single controllable entity with respect to the grid. So particular to our program, the MCR program, we're really interested in projects that can island mode and that leverage front of the meter technology and serve community level benefits. 
Um, some of the projects that I will be highlighting in the upcoming slides are microgrids in Colorado that DOLA has partially supported, and I'll be talking a little bit about how those do or don't fit the MCR framework. Um, as a caveat, the CHP technical assistance folks that you'll hear from in a few minutes um, will be highlighting a lot of different types of projects. Um, MCR is technology agnostic, so as long as um, what project you're proposing um, meets the definition as seen here for a microgrid. We, we don't really care what type of technology you're leveraging, um, but just as kind of a caveat for the projects that we're looking at. Um, this is an overview of um, the two different types of grants that MCR is funding. Um, we are, our planning grants are open now through the end of March. Um, and you can see here the max award is 36K with a 25% cash match required. Um, and we are looking forward to launching our construction implementation grants later this year. Um, there is a 33% match for those um, implementation grants. Um, In-kind contributions are eligible, and you can see kind of the breakdown of, of the different appropriated dollars here. Um, so we are about a week into those planning grants being open and looking forward to um, seeing what, what folks are interested in putting together. Um, so now I'm going to switch over to talking a little bit about some microgrids in Colorado. Um, this is um, Red Feather Lakes, and this town is um, a pretty remote uh, mountain town. It has one transmission line, um, and it in, uh, this town went after funding to install a microgrid system that has a battery pack, um, solar, and a propane generator. And the purpose of this microgrid system um, is really a resiliency and emergency response um, emphasis and was developed between um, local, regional, and national partnerships and a, a number of different funding sources. And um, this size of this microgrid is, is similar to scope uh, for an MCR-related grant, um, but is not necessarily com very community-focused. Um, despite being you know, a, a resiliency metric, um, this is... Um, really a little bit more focused on emergency response. It does go to strengthening the resiliency of anchor institutions. So that is something that we would highlight if this um, program were to apply, you know, retroactively for MCR funding. Um, we have another example here, Pitt King County. Um, this was partially funded through DOLA, a renew EIAF grant. Um, that was 1.7 million. The total project um, was estimated at 3.4, although I have heard uh, newer, newer numbers in the recent um, weeks about expanding that, that project scope. Um, and the batteries are, are capable of storing six to eight megawatts. Um, and you know, there's, there's some integration of solar array as well. Um, this project is actually based around a business center, um, an, an airport, and some other related um, infrastructure. So this project is, is more community facing than the previous example. Um, however, it's not um, in a, in a um, super socioeconomic vulnerable area. Um, and this project would be um, a little larger than the scope of the projects that MCR will fund under construction grants, but is a really good example of multiple benefits for a community. Um, we do have on um, that climate webinars website, as I mentioned earlier, there is a, a webinar up there with Pitkin County Climate Action Manager. So um, if you're interested in learning more about how that project was developed, feel free to check that out. The last example we will highlight is um, from San Miguel. Um, this was funded through DOLA. It was a $1.1 million um, dollar, uh, solar PV and energy storage microgrid system, and it connected two different parts of a sheriff's department um, and centered around mission critical loads. Um, so as you can see here, we also have um, a climate webinar that references this project. Um, and this project is, is really the right scope for an MCR grant. The dollar amount is pretty um, similar and it is supporting anchor institutions for a rural community. However, this project doesn't directly impact community facing organizations. Um, so that is one element we would call out just in terms of how this relates to the MCR program. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Carlos and Pam for their presentation on um, 
their technical assistance program and um, just some more information about projects that they've supported in the past. Thanks, Julia. Hi, my name is Pam Gallagher and I'm the assistant director for the upper uh, CHP TAPS. So everybody's asking, <laughs> what are, um, you know, what are the CHP TAPS? We're 10 entities. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Carlos, do you have the, um, do you have the, uh, the slides? Julia, Julia is passing the slides. Julia, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Julia. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. Okay. <laughs> so the CHP TAPs are 10 entities created by the DOE to promote the deploy deployment of combined heat and power systems. Um, in the last two years, the program has expanded its scope to distributed generation, incorporating solar, battery storage, microgrids, and other related technologies. So what the CHP TAPs do is we work with different strategic stakeholders, such as regulators, utilities, state energy offices, and policymakers to reduce barriers to using CHP. We also work with associations of potential end users, providing information on successful applications, case studies, and business models. Um, the goal is to help potential end users feel familiar with the technology and to support its adoption. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the map of the 10 CHP TAPs and the states um, each TAP provides services to. Carlos and I work for um, the South Central and Upper West CHP TAPs, which covers 11 states, inclu including Colorado. And you can see those in the, um, the purple and the violet states. Um, the slide presents the points of contact for every CHP TAP, and no matter where your facility is in the United States, someone is available to help. Um, feel free to reach out to us for no-cost assistance. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, next slide, please. So Julia has already presented a definition of a microgrid, so we're not going to go into too much depth with the next several slides. Microgrids can incorporate different technologies that include on-site power generation, um, energy storage, power distribution, and control and energy management systems, in addition to a potential interconnection with the main grid. And next slide, please. Okay. Um, combined heat and power has proven to be an anchor re resource for many microgrids. Uh, um, about 30% microgrids listed in the DOE's microgrid installations database um, combine combined heat and power with other technologies. Um, with a CHP system uh, providing baseload electric and thermal energy, microgrids can add solar and wind resources, um, demand management, energy storage, central controls, and uh, electric vehicle charging. Uh, flexible CHP systems can ramp up and down as needed to balance renewable loads and provide uh, grid services. Next slide, please. Um, as mentioned in the previous slide, um, CHP can work together with solar, wind, energy storage, and other technologies forming resilient microgrids. Compared to a single distributed generation technology, a microgrid with multiple technologies um, can provide stronger resilience, uh, higher operational flexibility, and multiple value streams. For utilities, microgrids can take advantage of local energy resources to offer affordable power, increase grid reliability, power quality, um, ancillary services, and demand response punctuality. Um, for end users, Microgrids provide reliable and resilient power with the potential for energy and emission savings. With that, um, I'd like to pass the mic to Carla, Mike to Carlos, who will present project uh, snapshots. Thank you very much, Pam and Julia. Can you hear me okay? I will take that as a yes. 
<clears throat> can we go to the next slide, please? So um, our goal in this presentation is to uh, help you understand how the CHP tabs work and how the CHP tabs can support the projects that are in a scope for this, pro for this program. Um, I'm going to be presenting in the next few slides on different projects, some based in Colorado, some based in other states, to continue presenting on how to work with the CHP tabs. And I will give some additional background on the CHP tabs for you to understand what really, what's our role here, right? So let's, let's start with the projects for now. So yes, uh, in this slide, you can see a brief list of projects. Uh, one of the characteristics we have in the work we do for the Department of Energies, we cannot release the information on the end user. So in this slide, unless they authorize, authorize us to do so, so we are presenting as a very brief summary. In, in the last few years, we have worked in different projects in, the, in Colorado, supporting mu municipal buildings, greenhouse facilities, wastewater, uh, whiskey to power, sol sorry, uh, uh, applications for oil and gas, wastewater treatment plants, municipal, multifamily buildings, uh, commercial buildings, manufacturing plants, recreation centers, military campuses, hotels and resorts, all kinds of facilities. I see the question in the, in the chat saying, do the CHP tabs have funding available? We do not provide funding, but the Department of Energy is paying the CHP tabs to provide services to all types of entities within our regions. And as, as Pam mentioned before, Pam and I represent the Upper West uh, region, which includes Colorado. So that's one of the reasons we are here, because we can provide those services at no cost for, for you. Next slide, please. And let's go through different uh, examples. You might be familiar with this. This one is a very interesting project that was installed in 2017. Uh, is the Tooth Library at Colorado College. Uh, it was the first net zero academic research library in the United States, and it combines different components. It combines CHP 130 kilowatts cogeneration. It combines 115 also uh, kilowatts of solar, which makes of this CHP a very of this system more resilient. Um, so uh, the characteristics. I mean, I don't want to go too too much in depth with this, but you know. Uh, CHP really helps the building balance the thermal and power loads and provide power when we have uh, when the sun is not uh, produced when the, the sun is not at its peak or, or helping us provide uh, providing clean power and free power. So it's it's a real good combination. You see at the bottom of this slide a link to the project profile of the Department of Energy where you can find additional details. Next slide, please. This is an industrial application, which makes sense or not for this project, but it's in the size uh, of, uh, of the projects we are looking at for this, uh, for this program, sorry. It's a, a, a brewery that is generating their own biogas for, um, for their usage in this case. So they take that biogas, burn it in a combined heat and power unit to generate power for their own consumption. We've seen similar projects led by utilities when they install the, their, their, their system, their power generation system next to the factory and take advantage of the Gaia gas or just take the waste materials. Anyway, this is an example of uh, similar to the next one, but the next one is kind of more, a, little, a bit more community focused. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, this is not the one I was talking about. Anyway, <laughs> uh, this is the public safety headquarters in. It's uh, Gettysburg, Maryland. So as you can see in the picture, this is a beautiful system that combines solar, two megawatts of solar with almost one megawatt of combined heat and power. So it's producing clean power from the solar, it's producing uh, uh, electricity and hot water. And again, these systems came to replace emergency generators. So it's, it's the economic, so that improved the economics of the project uh, quite a bit. Again, you have the link at the bottom of this slide to get to get more, see more information about this specific project. Um, if we can go, please, to the next slide. That's the project I was talking about. It's also biogas focus. It's a CHP biogas system 
177 kilowatts. Um, these systems, these type of systems have helped several wastewater treatment plants remain operative when there is a disaster. Uh, so we are based in Houston, Texas, and during the Hurricane Harvey, it was there was big issues with the wastewater treatment plants not being able to be flooded, not being able, taking weeks for, for, for these plants to come online again. Um, these kind of systems, this power generation, this on-site power generation system don't not only use clean power, but all, can also provide resilience to these type of facilities. And also, as we mentioned in this slide, they might have very short paybacks, like eight years in this case, uh, reducing environmental emissions, the environmental emissions associated with these plants uh, quite a bit. Very interesting cases. Next slide. This is a community, um, more like a community focus uh, project, also, also on the size uh, that this program can 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 fit. Um, we are talking about a, a fuel cell system installed in Saint Helena Hospital in California. Uh, this system produces sixty three percent of the hospital electricity requirements. Uh, during the summer can provide 100% of the thermal loads, which is basically hot water. And the system operates nonstop, 24 seven. This, this type of technology is very, is very good when you need um, resilience, when it, when, especially 24 seven operations. But anyway, there are other technologies, as we mentioned before, that can support these technologies like solar, battery storage, and many technologies that can be combined with these types of projects. Uh, with these types of technologies to, to really create the, the microgrids this program are, are funding. Next slide, please. Then let me jump on how to work with the CHP tabs and provide some background on, on why we are called the CHP tabs, right? This program, uh, the CHP tab program, CHP tab stands for Combined Heat and Power Technical Assistance Partnership. Our program was originally designed to support the deployment of combined heat and power, meaning cogeneration, and waste heat to power applications. The, the, the foundations of this program were, was about promoting one of the most efficient technologies using fuel or fossil fuels. Um, but two years ago, the program switched and opened the resources we use, opened the assistance we provide to all distributed generation, the distributed generation, clean energy power, battery storage, uh, you name it. And we, we can probably provide support for, for your microgrid, right? That's one of the reasons we are here because we provide no cost technical assistance to anyone interested in knowing if these technologies or microgrid configurations are a good fit for, for their site. Um, there was another thing I wanted to add anyway. I said no, uh, no cost. Uh, no, uh, can we go to the previous slide? Yeah, thank you, Julia. I said no cost because it's not like we provide funding for, for the studies. We do the studies on behalf of the Department of Energy and they review our work and approve our work. So uh, our technical assistance starts with us requesting some information about the site and providing what's called in this, in this chart a screening or what we call a screening technical assistance. It's a preliminary analysis. It's a quick analysis we do like in, in a week, uh, like using different tools, uh, most of them developed by the Department of Energy to know which combination of technologies will be a good fit for your site and how, how does the, this technology allow you to reach your goals when it comes to resiliency, cost efficiency, environmental emissions. Um, and that's the first level of analysis. We get back to you in a week with some results on feasibility, technologies, sizes, initial cost, environmental emissions saved, all these uh, preliminary analysis. The second type of analysis is the feasibility analysis. In the past, the Department of Energy, I'm talking about four or five years ago, the Department of Energy was funding us to do feasibility analysis, but they don't want us to do that anymore because we are, will be technically competing with other engineering companies or the project developers. So what we do is we, from this point on, we collaborate with the end user and are, we, are, we act like, like a third party independent support 
to on the end user side. So we support end users validating, like for example, feasibility analysis developed by other companies. We provide uh, perform uh, engineering analysis, try to answer specific questions, or, or even support the user through the procurement operations, maintenance, or commissioning in what we call advanced technical assistance. So the first level in this slide uh, screening, the, the blue box here corresponds to screening technical assistance. The other three boxes to the right uh, represent advanced technical assistance we can provide at no cost for, for any entity in our inside our region. Next slide, please. And I won't spend too much time on this because you will have the opportunity to talk to us in the in the next uh, in the next events, next webinars. Uh, so this is the typical site survey we share with an entity when they want to work with us. As you can see, there are questions here like, are you concerned about future energy costs? Uh, what, are you concerned about reliability? Questions trying to figure out what are your goals for this system? Why are, would you want to look in this case at the microgrid? Uh, what's the goal of that microgrid? This is resilience, cost efficiency, environmental savings, all of them. Um, what else? Are you expecting to replace, upgrade, or retrofit some equipment? Because that helps with the economics of the of the program uh, of the of the project quite a bit. Um, do you anticipate any expansion? So we try to see in which moment are you in this. So in this program, the program talks about this is specifically designed for shovel ready projects. So we already know that this this project idea is has been going for, going on for a while. But in our regular technical assistance, we need to know if people is looking on, is planning on doing something in three years, in five years, next year. So because you know, it's that's an important factor for for the type of project we identify for them. Again, um, some questions about: uh, Do you have access to on-site low-cost fuel resources like landfill gas, farm manure, food processing waste? Uh, do you have access to solar? Do you have access to uh, I mean, different different questions on that regard. What's the what's the, the local resource you have access to? We can use for this waste heat. Uh, different 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 applications that might. Uh, so in the end, we want to identify potential applications. That's that's my point. Next step. Next slide, please. And then we require usually for existing facilities, we we request twelve months of uh, electricity and natural gas, meaning thermal demand and power demand billing information. If we have 15 minute interval data available, that's much better for our modeling purposes. But uh, as you can see, most of the questions in this slide are focused on the cost, fuel costs, electricity costs. So on those costs, you will be offsetting. But anyway, this, this survey is, is customized depending on the client, depending on the program. So you might get a similar um, survey ours, or our survey could be more focused on, on some specific questions, if that makes sense. And this is, uh, I think these are the, mainly the, the last slides I have, like three or four more. Uh, this presents the uh, a department, a tool developed by the Department of Energy on, on for the feasibility of combined heat and power systems. Um, we also use other tools also developed by the DOE. We have our own modeling capabilities. And when we do that, the Department of Energy verifies our work and validates it. So um, in this case, what you see here is, a, is an Excel model of combined, of combined heat and power system in which after you input all the information we have requested before, we come to the solution that the right system for these facilities, for example, a 44 kilowatt CHP system, uh, if you go to the next slide, you will see the type of uh, uh, the information we provide in, at the STA level. So like, for example, it's very small here, but you will have the slide. So um, we provide information about the size of the system, the technology, in this case was a reciprocating engine. We also provide information about the energy consumption. How does it look like? You can see in this column, in, in one column, the column name, name base case, how did the um, your energy supply was before installing CHP. How will it look before? How will it look before after you install CHP? Also, there is a section about operating costs. How do they change? How much money you will save installing these, these systems? And the last section is about the financial aspect. So what's the cost of the system? Do you have access to any incentives? 
um, are you saving, are you expecting to save some costs by installing this system? Like if I install a new CHP unit, I don't have to buy a new uh, backup generator. So if you, you have those kind of savings that we can also factor that into the into our calculation tools. And at the end, you can see a small sensitivity analysis table. But as I said, this is just one of the tools we use for that sensitivity, for that uh, technical assistance. So uh, we'll, I hope we will be working with you soon on not only about using this tool, but other that also cover solar, battery storage. Uh, and as we said, as I said, if if the if the um, operations you are thinking about are quite complex, we, we will develop our own or adapt our own models to provide the, the information you, you need, to provide you, provide you with information you need. Next slide, please. A few resources uh, by the, uh, provided by the Department of Energy. So as you can see, there is a microgrid installation database developed by the Department of Energy in 2021, where you can find many multiple types of microgrids um, I think as of today, there are 688. Uh, and this, this kind of technologies are, microgrids are becoming very, very popular, as you know, and this database grows every, every month. We provide new data about new facilities. So if you are looking for examples of similar facilities in the US, then what you're trying to develop, you can go, use this resource. And in the next slides, you will find some more generic resources about who the CHP tabs are, uh, about the Better, Build Better Buildings program and resilience uh, CHP for Resilience Accelerator, um, planning guides, you know, different resources, not only from the Department of Energy, but as you can see from uh, Better Click Lab. Um, but go to the next slide, please. The main message I would like to, to end here with, and if you feel free to move to the next slide, is we are here to support any of the projects any of the project ideas you might have. Uh, we are happy to look at the feasibility of it. We are happy to try to answer specific questions for you on costs, uh, timelines. Uh, how we can provide different types of technical assistance and try to answer different questions. Yes, feel free to reach out to us through the program this time. Let us know how, how can we help and we will be happy to help. Thank you so much, Carlos and Pam. Very appreciated. Um, we will get to questions in a moment, um, but before we turn it over to that, I just wanted to flag, um, we will have two hour long office hours with these two lovely people here um, that will be available for um, questions. Now, as, as Carlos just mentioned, there's a lot of in-depth work um, that, that their program can do um, specifically to help your community's projects. And so um, if it makes more sense to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them to kind of develop more um, in-depth analysis, um, please feel free to reach out to them directly. However, um, if you have more general questions and just want to sit in and kind of understand what other types of questions other utilities are asking or um, other projects are considering, please feel free to join us for either um, the February 23rd um, session or the March 22nd session. These are both scheduled within the time frame that um, our MCR planning grants are open. So that should give you guys um, you know, enough time to think through considerations for your application um, and pop into those um, if you um, are interested in, and have further questions. Um, so I will end uh, our, our uh, talking at you there um, and would love to open it up for folks um, who have questions. So um, please raise your hand or, or write in the chat um, and we will get to them. So it looks like there's a question from Jocelyn. Are there any efforts to negotiate with or incentivize utilities to interconnect with microgrid projects? Uh, I'll, I'll give that to Carlos and Pam, that question. You repeat that question, please. Yeah. Are there any efforts to negotiate with or incentivize utilities to interconnect with microgrid projects? There are there are efforts. Um, I don't 
not very familiar with incentives uh, because as you know, it's at the discretion of the utility and then the conditions to interconnect with the distribution system depend on the on the distribution system operator. So the, I know there are efforts, there are many conversations and that's one of the main barriers microgrids are facing some, in some states, in some counties, in some uh, regions. But uh, as far as I know, incentives for utilities to interconnect with microgrid projects are not very, not very common. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Chris. Um, for planning grants that would be used for CHP to help us understand the feasibility of a project, I'm confused how we are planning to, or how we would use the planning funds. So my response to that would be, um, Carlos and Pam and their um, offerings are really available to help you hone in a little bit more on um, you know, your community's needs and vulnerabilities as it re relates to grid reliability, and they could help you um, be more directive with where you are considering developing microgrid assets um, that then you could apply for funding through MCR to do the, um, you know, the pro forma or the engineering study um, on a specific location. Um, I think where it comes in really handy to um, access the CHP resource is if you don't have um, clarity on exactly where uh, or what you know assets you want to leverage for um, your potential microgrid project, and you are looking to have someone kind of give you a direction and and be more um, you know in the weeds around some of the more technical layers of developing a microgrid. I will also turn it over to Carlos if you wanted to add anything on that. No, I think that's a perfect approach for us. We will be more than happy to help you identify which technologies might fit in the microgrid you are thinking about developing. We will be happy also if you have a design in mind to take a second look at it or provide you any feedback on, on, on the impacts that microgrid can, could have in your facility, the good impacts for sure. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, that's what we are here for. If you have any specific questions about I don't know. Sometimes we help we help utilities. I'm sorry, you help end users uh, figuring out interconnection rules or or trying to I mean try to assess them uh, to help them walk the path, walk, walk the way to 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 deploy in the projects in general. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see. Oh, there's another question. Let's see. Um, can the planning grants be used for the development of new or ex adapting to existing microgrid standards that would be able to be utilized in the development of affordable housing solutions in suburban and rural contexts? Just processing this question. Yes, it's um, a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, we are definitely open to um, applications or requests for funding that are use, utilizing um, existing assets. And um, I, I wouldn't see why not um, to answer that question. Marguerite, I'm not sure if you have any other insight. Um, yeah, you know, I would just add, I think it depends on the location of that affordable housing, um, you know, site um, and how and who it is serving and how it adds resilience. So does that affordable housing solution have a community space or is it really just for individuals? Um, you know, really going through the guidelines that we have on the MCR website, um, which I'm sure you've all seen, but I will drop in the chat again, um, and, and thinking from that lens. Um, but yeah, there's a lot, a, a, an affordable housing complex could be, I think, a strong proposal. I think it depends mm -hmm. on Again, those those specifics that are in the guidelines and how it ties to them. Great. Um, does anybody else have any questions? We have a, a bit of time, so um, make sure to, to get them in. Julia, there is one in the in the chat that you might, I mean, might be interesting to highlight. It's a question about, uh, it's a question you already answered through the chat. Uh, when, you see, you, when you say you're interested in projects operating in island mode, does that mean that they can be interconnected to the overall grid? 
and I think that that answer is important. It can be tied to the large grid, but has to have the ability to disconnect because that's the definition of a microgrid, right? Yeah. Great. Thank you for, for noting that one. I just saw another question come through. Could you talk through the definition of adding resiliency? Um, so for our purposes, um, you know, I think we're thinking about are these projects that are being proposed adding um, the ability to adapt and respond to extreme weather events, to um, the changing climate, to various infrastructure vulnerabilities, and really um, thinking through are these projects supporting as the name implies, a community level resilience, or are they supporting more of a utility um, back end resilience, which is obviously quite important, but not exactly what our project, our program is is geared towards. We're really looking for those projects that do have those community facing benefits. Um, and I think Marguerite kind of touched on this, but thinking about anchor institutions, um, all of this is in our guidelines, but anchor institutions that are supporting um, the overall resilience of a community. So being able to um, have the power stay on in a storm at the, the fire station or being able to continue to power a hospital if there's disruptive weather. So anything that you know, has that community layer um, is really what we're looking for. And I think you can argue, you know, your specific project's resilience for a community. We, we want you to do that in your applications, um, but we have just given, you know, just off the cuff and in our guidelines, a number of examples that would speak to um, what type of resilience we're looking for. Would this be just for renewable energy resources? No, um, our project, is, our program is, is technology agnostic. So we are, you know, it, it, it's great if it is renewable, um, but we are not um, only, you know, looking for renewable. We do have a preference for non-fossil fuel um, generation, but um, again, this is not a, a requirement to um, apply for funding from our program. Yeah, just before we move on from that question about resilience, I just want to point you, Demi, to the application that we have for the Microgrids for Community Resilience grant program. And Section F measures risks and vulnerabilities, um, so both socioeconomic, climate, as well as infrastructure risks and vulnerabilities. And as much as you're reducing those risks and vulnerabilities, the more resilience you're incorporating into the system. So um, that's just you know, there's a lot we can say. We at the Resiliency Office, of course, love resilience. Um, it's really about um, being prepared for future uncertainty and having the adaptive capacity to respond to shocks and stressors. Um, but, you know, for this grant program, that is really how we're defining it from the lens of building resilience into a grid system. Thanks, Marguerite. Um, all right. Has the idea of the historic downtown core becoming a resilient district that could be supported by a microgrid, can private property owners benefit from a microgrid in that district and would an energy district or SIM needed to be formed to allow this? I, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, I, I can try to help. Sure. <laughs> Please. If uh, so, usually, if there is a utility in the area, you can deploy distributed generation behind the meter. But for if for you to really have a community microgrid, I guess if that is the question, uh, the utility needs to be involved, of course. And there might be some projects about rewiring different areas uh, in different changing the layout of the power grid to a more resilient one or deploying the power from different substations. So there are many ways to make a downtown district more reliable when it comes to power. Um, so yeah, private property owners, of course, will benefit from microgrid in a district like that. Um, but the, the formula to develop that microgrid usually when you when you think about developing these microgrids in a territory where there is already a utility working, you have to work with the utility unless you just work behind the meter or inside your own parcel, inside your property. That's how it usually, that's the, the most common scenario for deploying a multi-building microgrid. Um, I don't know if I answered the question, but I we tried. Thank you, that was helpful. <laughs> 
Um, for this next question about construction grants, I'm gonna switch the slide back to this chart. Um, how much money is available for construction phase grants launching this year? Um, so as you can see, the max award is a million, um, but there um, will be, um, you know, about 1.2 available from state funding. Um, and we have, um, as we've spoken about before, um, we're, we're using some of the state funding as match for federal um, IIJA grid resiliency dollars that will be coming um, back to the state. So um, there will be additional opportunities there. Um, I'll just go back here. All right. Local politics and education play large roles. Many rural mindset and the managerial level are reluctant to engage with government funded projects in part because of lots of red tape and finding qualified technically astute grant writers. There are many obstacles in rural areas. Yeah, um, we definitely understand that there are, there's kind of a range of um, enthusiasm for these types of projects in rural areas. Um, part of having this webinar today and the future ones um, in the next few weeks is, is supporting folks via technical assistance um, on some of the more, um, you know, higher level technical sides. Um, part of what I would say back to this question, um, our state dollars um, for these planning grants are, you know, the, the lift for the reporting standards and such is a lot lower than it would be for federal dollars. Um, so folks should really take this opportunity to um, try to apply for this funding that is coming directly from uh, the general fund. Um, you know, I, I think that it's um, it's a lot less red tape than if you were going after federal funding. Um, as for grant writers, um, you know, as a state uh, uh, agency, we can't, you know, recommend specific folks, but there definitely are groups out there um, who are interested in supporting grant writing for um, some of these community projects. Um, and, and we can talk a little bit more about how that might look. We've had a number of um, groups reach out to us with that offering. So um, I would recommend you do a little digging around um, Colorado. And I think that there are, are some groups that are interested in providing that support. Um, okay. To what extent can these funds be coupled with federal funds? Um, so if this is a question around like stacking dollars for larger projects, um, because the state uh, planning grants are, are cash only match, um, you know, that is um, allowable for the state dollars, but for the federal dollars, we will not, it, it's ineligible to match uh, a federal funding opportunity with federal dollars as the match. Um, so that wouldn't be eligible. Um, however, we are going to have for the construction grants, uh, we have about two projects that can be funded via state dollars. And then we have the remainder of the projects being funded by federal dollars. So if you have, if, when we get to the construction phase of this application process, if you have a preference based on other funding you've received or um, reporting requirements and the capacity of your staff, um, you can indicate that in the application and we will try to take that into consideration. Um, all right. What is the anticipated award turnaround time for planning grants? Um, we are looking at about a month um, after the planning process ends, we'll be getting back to folks in May. Um, so we'll have about a month of review process internally um, and we'll be reaching out with um, award or denial letters in May. Great questions. If anyone is, you know, thinking of questions or considering, you know, typing in the chat, I might just take this time to mention because I do see a big mix of attendees and your backgrounds um, that although the planning grants and construction grants will have to be submitted by utilities, um, we do encourage all partners, um, you know, especially because this is a community facing microgrid grant program. Uh, we, we really encourage partners to also uh, work with their utilities in submitting a proposal. So just wanted to acknowledge that diversity in the attendees. Sure. 
um, and and just say we really hope that um, everyone takes advantage of the really great free training and technical assistance from uh, Carlos's team and Pam's team. And um, yeah, yeah, it comes up with some really great community facing projects. Um, can tribal governments apply without a utility? So for our program, the MCR program, um, tribal governments are not eligible to apply um, because it has to be a utility. But there are other um, Colorado Energy Office administered grid resiliency programs that tribal um, governments are eligible to apply for, um, including a lot of the IIJA money that's coming down the pipe. Yeah, and building on that, um, the tribes also have their own formula funding that yeah. they are pursuing uh, directly with the Department of Energy. All right. Well, um, last chance for questions, but um, I, I really appreciate you all joining today. Um, and we will follow up um, with these slides and um, with everyone's contact information so that you guys can reach out to Carlos and Pam directly. Um, please feel free to share, um, you know, this free technical assistance opportunity with other folks, you know, who may um, also be interested in in solutions like this. Um, we really wanna get the word out about this offering. Um, it's, it's a really good one. Um, and yeah, we appreciate everyone's time on this Tuesday. Um, if there's nothing else, um, I will go ahead and stop recording. Um,